before we actually start, I, I would really love to, we would really love to know the audience a little bit. So a quick poll, how many people have actually provisioned GPU? Raise your hand, oh, that's nice. I think uh, how in the cloud, like AWS or something like that. Okay. Okay. I think so this uh, is, but this is like two thirds. All right. Yeah. All right. How many are in in the Kubernetes cluster already? Oh, well, that's okay, a essentially lot. the same. All right. Wow, that's good. great. Good. Okay. But wait, wait. Yeah. So, who has provisioned TPUs not from AWS, GCP, or uh, maybe Azure? <laughs> okay. Okay. That's nice. Okay. Right. Great. Okay. Good. Six. Yeah. Hope you are in the right place. So uh, I would introduce myself first. So I'm Xiaoman. I've been in the, well, uh, data and infrastructure in, uh, for, for quite a long time. I'm in companies right now. Uh, we are in a very early stage startup. Yeah, uh, my name is Alex, or you know, Alexander Pucher. Yeah, yeah, cool. Same thing here. We're kind of both founding engineers at Parasail. Um, but essentially our, like the whole focus of what we've tried to kind of get in our minds over the last, like I guess like, one and a half years or so, right, mm -hmm. was really to go and say, how do we build scalable but also cheap and easy to use AI infrastructure, right? And then the funny thing is, you know, if you, if, as you can already tell from the poll, right, if you ever go and you say, hey, you want GPUs and want to do something for them, chances are you want to be in a Kubernetes cluster. Because, well, all the nice things of like, you know, service meshes and all the access control, like all the things that come with Kubernetes are really nice to have uh, when you already work with, uh, you know, just uh, LLMs and other, just the GPU heavy workloads, right? Because the GPU heavy workloads alone are already complicated enough. So if there's something to take care of the operations piece, then that's great, right? <laughs> Let's use it. So about a year and a half ago, right, so we uh, talked to our acquaintances and friends and we're like, hey, we want to do AI infrastructure and GPUs. And uh, essentially the resounding uh, response that we got is to just use AWS. You know, it's, it's great, it's easy, and you know, build your product there and then everything is going to be fine. And that sounds good. You know, you, you just create an account, you know, you sign up and you go, hey, this is great. You know, I'm a funded startup, I even get startup credits. So how about I spawn a few GPUs so that I get to try out, you know, what say VLLM has to offer right now. So you go, you want to start a GPU instance, and uh, you look through it and you go, hey, uh, can I have like an A100, or like maybe even an H100, you know, something beefy to try out? And uh, it's, uh, well, let's just say that it's crickets. Because it turns out that getting quota uh, on the large clouds for like the, the beefy GPUs is surprisingly difficult. And then if you go and you reach out to your sales rep, um, then they say, well, you know, we can get your beefy GPUs, but there's one caveat. We need you to sign a contract for like at least two years. And you're a startup, right? If you're a startup and you just want to try out the GPU, you don't immediately want to, you know, well, talk about marriage proposals on like the first date. And that's really what brought us to this step. Where I said, okay, this is great. AWS has credits, but no quotas for the GPUs that we want. And then the same thing happened with Azure and the same thing happened with, well, GCP as well. So, well, there's Lambda Labs and there's others too, right? I mean, uh, if you walk through the showcase, then you know, hey, uh, you know, okay, that's, that's Lambda, that's Core Weave. Uh, actually, the more you dig, the more you figure out that there's like all of these providers that have data centers full of GPUs that are financed with like venture debt and like venture capital that pay like 8% interest and they really want workloads. But nobody goes there because in contrast to being in say AWS and having you know, a nice EKS cluster where you push a button and you get a GPU and it spins up and everything works, the only thing that you get typically from a bare metal machine or like a VM running somewhere, like in Lambda, is port forwarding. And then all the other things like, you know, <laughs> networking, these small details like TLS and NAT and doing all this ingress and egress mashing and then potentially hole punching if you want to get out of those VPCs. And really all the operational pains, right, that are solved with Kubernetes, they're not immediately available there. And then even if you go to Lambda and you, know, you write your Ansible scripts and then your bash scripts and you figure out, hey, this is how I get Kubernetes running on Lambda, you still figure out that even Lambda 
has some quotas that apply. So all your, your bash scripts and all the nice integration that we now build for like that one cloud provider to get to Kubernetes, you get to repeat the same thing for you know, data crunch and voltage park and you know, all the others and, and we'll talk about those. And so I really miss my Kubernetes cluster. And so that, Shaman, right? Yeah. So in a nutshell, after you know, talk, all this talk about motivation, what do we really want? We want one Kubernetes cluster, right? The one cluster to rule them all that has as many GPU instances from wherever we can get them for as cheap as possible. And we will not be locked into long-term contracts. We not be locked into all well, quotas. We don't want to be locked into like a single cloud provider because it's expensive and it's limiting. Right? So in a way we want to do federation, but we won't, don't want to really deal with multiple clusters. We have one cluster, we want to have our workloads there, and then if we have, you know, mainly inference workloads in our case, then we want to get these GPUs into that cluster and simply take advantage of all the benefits that Kubernetes has to offer with you know, failover and, and fault tolerance and like all the, the nice ways of just making operations easier, but still get the cheapest and the best GPUs from wherever we can, right? We want freedom. And now in order to enable this, there's a couple of preconditions that we need to fulfill. And probably the most painful, like the first one that we need to check off this list is that we need to make sure that we have secure node to node connectivity, kind of like a full mesh, right? It's kind of like if you have Kubernetes in just one data center, all right, you know, everything is maybe in the same like VNet, everything is easy. But if you're talking about getting GPUs from potentially different providers, right? Essentially having one Kubernetes cluster that technically spans like multiple providers, like sure in the same region, but like multiple data centers. You've got to figure out first how to make sure that all of these things can talk to each other securely. And once you have an overlay like this, then you can plant Kubernetes on top of it, and then you, know, you get all of these benefits like, oh, well, you know, resilience to node failures, this automatic like, self-healing, the recovery, like all the operational benefits that Kubernetes has. Okay. So before we dive into the technical details, here's essentially the, the caveat about what we're really talking about here when we talk about AI workloads. In our case, we focus on inference, right? Classic like language models, like multimodal, but mainly inference, right? So don't think it's like a high performance cluster for training base models. That's not what we're interested in here. We want to do inference, right? You give us, I don't know, a Llama 70B, it drops into the system, it just starts working. And so when you talk about inference workloads like that, then there's typically two or like maybe three types of workloads that you'll see. There's the so-called, you know, synchronous kind of like chatbot style inference, right? You send a request, uh, you get the chat response back, and the thing that matters is latency, right? You, when, you, when you send a request, you want to have an answer quickly. But maybe in order to achieve that latency, you will sacrifice throughput. The second thing is these asynchronous or like batch style workloads, right? Where you say, hey, um, maybe here is like 50,000 requests or like 5 million uh, queries or prompts. Maybe you're generating, uh, you know, test data and you just want to run through that. I mean, you know it's gonna take some time. You, know, you submit the job, maybe you come back like several hours or like a day later. And the thing that matters the most there is of course, A, that the job actually gets finished so it doesn't crash somewhere in the middle, and second, that it's cheap. And the interesting thing about this type of workload is that it actually tolerates some latency. And when I say it tolerates latency, you know, it, I mean latency at the order of like maybe 100 milliseconds or so. And that opens up a couple of interesting opportunities. Because it means that whether I do synchronous you know, requests and yes, yes, I want to have a response soon, but when the response comes back in like a second or two or three, that's fine. And for batch, we are, again, it doesn't matter. Like I might come back the next day. And so what this means is that even if I do wide area networking, you know, potentially if I send a request from like the West Coast to the East Coast and back, and I have like a latency there of like you know, 60 milliseconds or so, that is okay. And that enables the, the solution, essentially, that we came up with, which says, hey, if I start a Kubernetes cluster somewhere, I'll probably have a core in one place. But I already suggested that I want to be free from locking, right? I might bring up like the core of my Kubernetes cluster, say in AWS, because that's where all of my customers are. 
But then I want to be able to bring in GPUs from somewhere else. And the way that we accomplish this right here in kind of like the, the TLDR of our solution is to say, all right, we will solve node-to-node -node networking with kind of like a wire guard, kind of like essentially tail scale is our solution that we really used here, but a wire guard overlay of all the nodes in the system, kind of all the data plane will communicate over wire guard. This gives us like a uniform networking fabric to use, right, and rely on. And whenever an additional GPU node is brought in, whether this be from, you know, Lambda or Data Crunch or even, you know, AWS or GCP, essentially, regardless of what cloud provider I have, I can now take these nodes, make them part of my WireGuard mesh, make them part of my Kubernetes cluster as like this periphery, maybe if you push one yeah. button, right? Yeah. And then this periphery of GPUs that can tolerate some latency and will actually host and run the workloads can then connect to like some core thing that you know, runs by control plane and all the CPU workers and all the usual stuff that I have. So you end up with potentially uh, a structure that looks like this, where there's like the core of your cluster, say on the US West Coast uh, in this example, but then I bring in GPUs from potentially all over the globe. And that sounds kind of wacky, and it did sound wacky to us, at least, in the beginning. But it turns out that even though Kubernetes wasn't really meant to be used like this, it works surprisingly well. There's a few caveats that we need to address. But really, before we talk more about like, the technical details and so on, let me prove to you that this actually works. Yeah. Okay, um, I will, for now, quickly show something uh, first. This is one of our, our real cluster here. Uh, I use Lens, so it's better visualization. For a simple example, actually, we uh, for this cluster, you can see these five nodes are actually control plan nodes, ETCT master, and they actually have six months life now. And these nodes are actually allocated GPU nodes from TensorDoc. They are 3090 GPU, basically garage GPUs. Uh, later, we'll run a uh, further test to run real workflow on it. But basically, these four nodes are created yesterday and allocated setup. You can see the time frame, whatever. And we have a happy hour, a happy cluster running quite well. Now, we, before we show the real demo, let's go through the small steps of how we actually end up into creating such a cluster. Then you will have good understanding how this cluster works. Now, before we actually started creating this Kubernetes cluster, the first thing that, this is my favorite quote, um, is a, the best way to run Kubernetes is to have someone else run it, right? Since all the major clouds runs Kubernetes so well, the first thing is just try to actually add it. Can we add our GPU node from outside places into existing EKS, AKS, or EK, GKE? But the answer is no. And there are something close. Uh, if you look into the ARC or EKS anywhere, in the end of the day, you still have to run your Kubernetes cluster. So it means that we can't have someone else run it, right? Now, we uh, decided that we need to get our hand, like, feet wet, time to start learning. So we actually started trying to create Kubernetes the right way from beginning, etcd, kube admin, and whatever. It's not that difficult, right? It's a, <laughs> we know the concept, but <laughs> boy, it's a, it's a huge learning curve. Uh, trust me, it's, a, it's a very hard connecting them together. So basically, this feature is what I feel the, when I try to connect things together. The networking is really, really high in Kubernetes. And uh, a huge shout out to the people who actually run Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we actually cheated a little bit because uh, we are not hardcore network admin, and then we run K3S. It's actually very, very beginner friendly. We will have a cluster that we can play with, and we can learn things try by maybe by destroying things or configure in the wrong way and figure out. So now we have the Kubernetes cluster, at least control plan. Now the second question is, uh, we are trying to bring in a GPU into this control plan. Keep in mind that all these GPU providers are across, across the globe, right? So we had to connect them over the public internet. Now, speaking of connecting over the public internet, the IPsec and OpenVPN, this kind of OVPN technology are very already proven technology that they work quite well. 
um, the only issue is that they actually are site-to-site -site connection. That if we add another provider, there's a lot of setup to, to make it happen. So um, on the other hand, there are things like Kilo, which is quite promising, but in the end of the day, you still have to do the router configuration, which is similar to the IPsec thing. So we end up trying the TailScale uh, WildGuard to help out. And TailScale actually spent a lot of effort trying to figure out how to do the node discovery, auto setup connection, all those kind of things. It's very helpful for adding a new place. And WildGuard itself uh, is well famous already, so there's a lot of talks out there in this KubeCon. Now, actually, we, we later find out there's a very good documentation of K3S and the TailScale integration like experiment feature. This one is a huge saver, and I really need to thank those authors. But in the end of the day, when we add a new, actually this is a starting a new cluster, it turns out to be just one command line setting the side range of your pod and service, and that's it. And then you will have a Kubernetes cluster with a tail scale connection, and the setting of a worker is as simple as these two. Just a few command line, it shows up. And it works quite well. And speaking of no discovery, uh, TailScale actually has a very good blog. I link it in the end. It's really good reading. Go there. The network admins will be very angry about this blog. They're trying to figure out how to penetrate the firewalls, trying to set connections behind the firewalls of two things. But anyway, it's very really interesting to read. But it seems simple, but it's really many things in the, in the, in the end. Now, after we run the cluster for a while, actually one of the cluster actually melts down. So the nodes cannot talk to each other anymore. So instead of uh, fixing this, we actually, because we actually tried the GitOps uh, concept, we actually rebuild the cluster quickly. This is a huge shout out to the GitOps concept and the Flux community. Now, the simple uh, thing we learned is that the ETCD cluster the control plan, they had to be in the same subnet, meaning if there are some cloud providers, if they can't provide subnet connection between your HA nodes, then we can't use them. But uh, mostly, it's, a, it's also written right now in the document. Uh, I wish they actually had that before I actually run into this. But now, there's a second challenge, actually. This is uh, the same picture. Now that we are our cluster at geolocation like spread out across the globe, it means that our Kubernetes cluster actually have multiple regions. So the routing inside the cluster and the ingress is actually uh, not a simple problem anymore. So K3S comes, with, comes in with traffic that every node can become an ingress. And then the ingress route and how to handle traffic, you have to configure it very carefully. I think this morning there's an envoy talking about geolocation-based routing, whatever. There's no, no silver bullet that just finds everything. You have to control it, and you have to learn your Kubernetes ecosystem and your tools. And then you can control how like, traffic goes into your cluster. Now, we, without all this, I think um, the question is, have we achieved our goals that uh, Alex mentioned? Do we actually meet all this? The thing we want to do actually is we want to do a small quick demo. So this is the scary part. Now for this cluster, um, we already have the cluster up and running. I skipped the part. If we have time later, we can try to see if we can demo how to bring in a new worker node. Um, right now I have a simple script that tries to submit the batch job into this cluster. The script is uh, very straightforward. Um, I don't think we need to show it. Just try to submit the job to the... To... Now, this job, this script will try to submit 30 of them. And it will keep uh, jumping. Now, this job is going to show up in our batch workload place. Actually, it's here. By the way, before we wait for this one, that's uh, what we are talking about. Uh, actually, I can show you how this pricing, like for this kind of hyperstack, look at the price here. And 
the data crunch. Later, if we have time, we'll try to demo, but look at this one. If you try to deploy something, it has H200 spot and whatever. So <laughs> it's a really convenient, but back to our UI. Now we can see all these batch jobs are submitted. Uh, it's listed here. Now, they are, some are scheduling because I submit. You see some of them are scheduling, some are waiting for capacity. It's a bit too small. But this is a batch job that's submitted and is scheduled to some of the nodes here. If we come back to the pods here, this is our namespace that has the jobs. You can see these jobs are already running, like 40, 50 seconds. So it's scheduled to this California node. There's a one from Estonia, and this Indiago job also gets a job. So this job will keep going, and once it's finished, it's completed. It's a, it's a very short one for demo purpose. But we can see this just keep going, and the job gets scheduled and keep running, right? Now, we will continue with our talk of other stuff. Um, I think we can just, yeah. Okay, sure, Let, let's switch this up. Okay, so we, we kind of have the demo running in the background, right? But the question is still, okay, well, did we achieve like some of the goals that we have? Okay, so we talk about it, all right, we have a single Kubernetes cluster and we do this wacky thing with like, okay, wire guard everywhere and it kind of works as you see, like you know, jobs are coming up. Now, the second question is, well, do we have actual freedom here from different providers? Uh, the answer is yes, actually we can bring in virtually any provider. Uh, and anything that opens up, uh, you know, a VM or a bare metal piece uh, is actually amenable to that approach. The one thing that doesn't work so far is RunPod, but even there is like options essentially to, to make this work. But we wanted to really push this, right? So like, okay, you know, it's nice, it's a toy workload, you know, yeah. But like, does the fault resilience of Kubernetes actually work when you do crazy stuff like this? Like, you know, kind of globally distributed nodes of Kubernetes. So we decided, let's push the limits, right? We said, okay, there's salad cloud out there. It's kind of like safety at home, right? Where like you, you use just 3090s in like different garages running collectively to do something. We figured, can we build like a small version of this ourselves? So we took the approach that you just saw, also live, right? Um, right now, I think we're running with like four of them, but yeah. we put like 20 or 30 of them in a cluster. And you know, okay, uh, 20 or 30, 30 90s, all of them running Llama, um, well, hook it up to some LLM gateway, put some load against it, and you know, see what happens. Just Keep sending requests. It turns out that if you have 30 of these GPUs in a cluster, <laughs> essentially stuff goes down all the time, the time, but it doesn't really matter. Because everything is in a Kubernetes cluster, guess what, a node goes down, now nah, well, deployment automatically spins up another replica. A node dies, oh well, just manually add a new one. Well, it automatically gets scheduled, all the pods are there, the workload is fine. Right? So essentially the operational benefits of Kubernetes immediately kick in. Meaning, yeah, stuff goes down, but who cares? The fault tolerance in the system actually handles this pretty gracefully. And so it was actually interesting to see. I mean, having like 30 of these nodes, like literally everywhere from, you know, so you saw California and like Estonia and like Japan and in, 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 in South America, and it, it just keeps working. So this was very encouraging to see. So okay, the fault tolerance works, but what else? We said we wanted to actually do like heavy computation, right? Right now you have some batch jobs, all right, the batch jobs have some requests in them. They're not like that heavy, but we figured, all right, if you can do this with 3090s, let's see if the system can also deal with, you know, actual heavy workloads. Like what if you have, you know, a bunch of H100s crunching through, you know, a serious amount of data, you know, essentially like tens of gigabytes of essentially just uh, images, right? You, you want to do image labeling, you extract images, you create, you know, I think this was a workload of like maybe 20 or 30 gigabytes or so. You take those, you put them in an S3 compatible store that deals with some of the geo replication. And then, well, it's a work queue, right? So get two of those beefy nodes, right? And in that case, I think this was uh, what Voltage Park and uh, maybe Data Crunch. Yeah. Yep. So 
take them, hook these nodes, you know, up in your cluster, make sure that the deployments work, and then, you know, just let them crunch from the work queue. And actually, even that worked pretty well, yep. right? So I mentioned, okay, we need to address the storage piece, right? If you do batch computation, hey, guess what? The input files might be big or the output files might be big or both. So you still need to address storage, right? And doing like stateful workloads, especially when they are geo-distributed, is like a very, very hard problem. But we said, okay, is there like some middle ground, some reasonable thing that we can do? And so we used actually Tigris, which is an S3-like, like essentially store um, that deals with lots of these uh, geo-distribution <coughs> issues. And you get your inputs from there, you know, you make sure that it's like nicely sliced, and then every one of these worker nodes just grabs the slice, you know, does the computation, eventually uploads the results back there, and then, you know, at the end of this whole workflow, you just combine them all together. And even that worked pretty well. That was very encouraging. Okay, so, have you achieved the goal, the original goal at least? Well, that's nice, but guess what? Now that we have fault tolerance, and that we have access to different cloud providers, and that this actually works with beefy workloads, let's see what else we can do. Well, it turns out one thing that's starting to arise right now is that, well, yes, okay, in the big clouds, there's like quotas on GPUs, but on the other hand, in, you know, let's say the not tier one, uh, like data centers, there's lots of GPU capacity available. Some of it is used, some of it is reserved, some of it is not actively in use, so suddenly you get a spot market for these GPU instances. And of course, when I saw that, ooh, that's interesting. Because now you're talking about you know, beefy kinds of uh, GPU nodes, you know, say like eight times H100s, that you can get a spot prices. So not just do you solve the quota issue, but uh, well, you know, if you can just add them to your cluster, let them work for like two or three or like whatever, 24 hours, however long you have to spot instance, you can speed up your workload. And you're talking about you know, <laughs> something less than like $2 per hour per one of these BFE GPUs, right? Which is much, much less than you would pay for you know, even a long time reservation on one of the prime uh, cloud providers. But guess what, it gets better, right? Uh, another thing that we saw this well, now there's new GPUs. Well, we have like Llama 4 or 5B, right? Lots of memory requirements. Wouldn't it be nice to have lots of memory? And guess what? Now there's new providers that bring H200s. Try to get H200 quota from your main cloud provider. Like if you're like a large company, okay, you can make it happen. But if you're, you know, a 10 person startup, then you're gonna have a hard time. But there's enough other providers out there that have those. You plug in your credit card and you get them. In fact, actually, Shaman was just looking and he found like, what was this, like $1.80 for H200s? Yeah, yeah. Crazy, I, I right? Uh, anyways, like the pricing that. is really good. Anyways, I don't want to ramble on too long about this, but the, the bottom line is, hey, well, we have all of these things. It works with GPUs. Can we actually do this with CPUs too? And it turns out that even the same markup that exists for like GPUs in like the major cloud providers exists for CPU workloads as well. So if you have um, you know, uh, an architecture where you can bring in resources from different cloud providers and you know, easily hook them up to your Kubernetes cluster, guess what? That works in general. That is pretty good. In fact, I would say the sum of like, these like, two things, like this geo-distributed like, fault tolerant system and the ability to bring in different cloud providers is much bigger than just these parts because you have the freedom to integrate multiple providers, you actually get like the, the best of like both worlds, right? It's like, it, yes, it's cheaper and you get the choice. And that was actually a really impressive uh, result out of that. Like, it was even more than we would have expected in the first place. Yeah. So yeah. we want GPUs and we want them in our Kubernetes cluster. Can be done. And then there's lots of benefits to it, but let's make sure that the whole thing actually works. So we actually, um, we actually do the demo already and maybe have a quick check uh, all the jobs submit as it's finished. It's actually all completed. Oh, they are still scheduling. Guess it's slow. <laughs> but I think, well, we can claim that it's already working. Um, so we actually running to the end of our presentation. There's a, uh, let me do that again. Now, there's a, a few backup slides about technical details. We skip out the technical limitations. 
Because all these things, if you actually get hands-on on it, you can come back and reference this. You will run into this problem in future. And there's a link and slides there. But basically, there's a limit, and there's uh, some small things to be care of. Um, and then we have the, I think there's a roadmap about whether we want to work with the auto scale or whatever things. But basically, um, we probably have four minutes for questions, and we can ask them. In the beginning of the slide, there's a link, and you can find the, we, can, we will upload this there. So. so the bottom line is, it really pays to break free from the bonds of yep. your major cloud provider. It's worth it. All right. Any questions or? Yeah, sure. Please. You can, you can speak where we repeat. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. So the question is, when uh, we talk about the nodes drop out all the time, is it because of network failure or whatever? So the most cases we see uh, happen, the, the dropout happens for these kind of garage clusters because they, they happen more. And by default, all these cloud providers, they have the GPU driver update turn up that there's a NVIDIA auto driver auto update feature. By default, most people turn it on. And then when it got updated, the CUDA doesn't got updated. And then it's version mismatch. And all the workload just dies. You have to manually reboot them. And because they provide this as a VM style, sometimes they don't do update for you. So it happens, I think most 90% of cases is this. And then there are small cases like GPU failure, that there's a hardware failure. I think those training guys actually run into a lot. We basically see that there's a hardware fault, so we had to return them. So it's a basic operation stuff. Maybe also for the context here, I mean, this garage cluster with like permanent node fails is expected, right? We really wanted to push it and see if we get the most unreliable hardware and network links, can we still get work done? And the answer is yes. <laughs> that was encouraging. If you actually run this in like uh, data center environments, right? For example, we have like Voltage Park and like Data Crunch and Lambda. Uh, this is pretty reliable. Usually, if you see nodes going down there, it's typically because hey, you know, literally like the power supply got fried on these things. Right? Yeah. But uh, of course, if you have reliable networking, then many of these outages just go away. Okay, the question is about the universal block storage. This is the part we haven't figured out the best solution yet. There are a few that is in this KubeCon, the Longhorn, the, the Rook, and, and all these, they are not fully designed to this kind of cluster. So we are actually trying to figure out the best way to say, do the EBS. Actually, the slide here talks something about this. Now, my our personal experience try to not put your lives on EBS style things. Do the data backup, try, try very hard. Even I think people mention the AWS EBS, sometimes it's also losing, losing things. But the, the idea is it's, it's a experimenting thing, but I need to be very careful about this. And the question behind, yeah. last one. Uh, so Um, so, you mentioned that uh, the question is about same thing, uh, some, nodes, uh, some nodes in the same region or data center. What's the situation? I, I didn't quite get that. Oh, so the question is, is this tailwind uh, or, or, or the peer-to-peer -peer VPN get established between those nodes in the mesh? Because um, obviously, mm. you know, always have some more kinds of this, right? Mm. I I think I can take that. Right? Uh, so the, the, question the question is, question. yeah, yeah. The, the question here is about saying, all right, if I have a bunch of nodes, and some of them are close together, whereas some of them are far away. Do I get like latency, like overheads talking between these two closed nodes, right? Do I go to some gateway far away and come back? And the answer is, uh, I actually get the benefit of proximity, like thanks to the WireGuard mesh, right? Because like the, the general layout of uh, WireGuard is literally a full mesh. So if there's two nodes in like the same subnet, yes, the communication is encrypted, but they literally talk to each other over that 
peer-to-peer -peer direct link rather than going all the way to the gateway. There, there are some CPU limitations, but uh, it's, it's a well-guard limitation itself.